Jason. How Monica. are you? It's great to see you. Thank you for coming all the way out to well, Ivy it's, City. It's fun to be here. Yeah, this is a hot new spot. How do you think bipartisanship has evolved since you started BPC? Kind of where on the spectrum are we right now? Washington's a tough place, but it um, much more is happening than I think most people understand if you're just watching the news and looking at the kind of caustic debates over five or six issues. You know, we're actually finding that um, there's so much disruption in the system, there's actually a lot more free agency on the Hill. We're finding members of Congress much more willing to kind of cross what would have been traditional party boundaries because there are no boundaries. And so on issues like paid family leave, on issues like the opioid crisis, you know, on a lot of the issues in energy policy, yeah. there's just a lot more kind of dynamic flux than I think um, most people are aware of. What glimmers of hope do you see for energy policy as we move through the near term? I think the system is getting exhausted by the polarization. I think you're seeing on the right that the energy for challenging the climate science has waned a whole lot. I think you're seeing on the left the understanding that just focusing on kind of the core cultural commitment to wind and solar and arguing that that's really kind of all you need is also running out of steam informed by recent studies like the IPCC. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we see at least some room for a serious conversation to solve a real problem. And we're finding more people on the left and right kind of moving into that space. We hear a lot about resilience. How do you define what resilience is? And what are the technologies that kind of um, make sure that we're staying resilient? So, you know, resilience is kind of one of the happy words in energy policy, like innovation. I think um, I've never met anybody who's opposed to either resilience or innovation, um, you know, it certainly demonstrates that you know environmental imperatives are one, but not the only desires that we have to have for a robust energy system. We have to think about security, both against the kinds of natural events that we've been seeing kind of you know batter our nation recently, but also you know, a lot of people aren't you know trying to make America as successful as we'd like it to be. And so, I think you know broadly, resilience to me speaks to both the hardening of infrastructure, but also to the need to have a diversity of energy sources and different types of energy production. And the latest UN um, IPCC report um, showed that um, if really we, good. is it good? Yeah. Um, let me go grab some. Um, if we don't do something immediately, if we don't act, um, we're basically about two decades away from a climate crisis. Um, so what are those technology levers to, that you think need to be pulled in order to avoid getting to that place of a crisis? So I think you know, this has been true for a while, but I think it's now more obvious than ever that we need to be grabbing every non-carbon electron we possibly can and pushing it through the system while figuring out how we can scale. So you know, to the extent that anybody believes that we can get to a sustainable global solution simply with our existing technologies. I think IPCC, I think the study that the Obama administration did, looking at kind of mid-century goals, argue that not only do we need every technology we have right now, but we have to imagine new technologies, including technologies that will actually draw carbon out of the air. I mean, there's so much negative momentum in the system from the last century of industrialization that if we really want to get to a sustainable future, we're going to need to push all of those different buttons. On the technology front, um, China's really leading the way on R&D investments. Um, the US ranks 12th in terms of dollars that are being put towards R&D uh, based on GDP. Um, so which technologies do you think the US is leading the race on and which ones are we falling behind on? So I mean, look, broadly, you know, we need to be doing more to invest in innovation, but I don't really buy into this kind of America's sliding down the slope towards you know, despair. We have the best universities in the world. Our lab system is unparalleled. We have a culture of creativity that with, I think, a little bit of focus um, will continue to lead the world. Where I think we're losing market share is going to be on manufacturing, which um, has been true across the board. And if we had more investment in innovation, if we had more clarity that low carbon energy was going to be a priority, I think you'd see that pick up. When we talk about where the business community is investing their dollars, um, what work needs to be done to kind of level set on what the definition of clean energy is and where their dollars should be going? So the 
I mean, fundamentally the challenge on climate is scale. I think that we need billions of everything. So having these nice technologies kind of hanging out in lab environments and demonstration projects for 20 years just isn't going to solve the problem. Fortunately, big industry are basically logistics companies and they're pretty good at scale. So I think we need to recognize that there's a difference between brand investment and we see a lot of commercials from a lot of energy intensive companies pointing out a couple of really nifty things they're doing and actual shareholder investment. Do you come to Ivy City often? You know, I am not quite cool enough to have known that Ivy City existed, but now that I do, I will hopefully uh, come back on the, you know, once every three years that my wife and I um, leave the kids. <laughs>